Nathan Rakesh, CEO of Motila Los Wala Asset Management Company, now joins us on the show. Uh, Nathan, thank you so very much for being with us this morning. Just wanting to know in an environment like this, which is so uncertain, where you have one day where the market sh really shoots off the charts, the next day you see it just coming crashing down. Many investors must be really jittery and must be wanting to know what exactly to do in a market like this. And what are you advising your clients right now? Uh, morning, Devina. I think a uh, very good question, primarily because right now what we are seeing is a divergence between the domestic environment and the global headwinds. So effectively, what we are seeing is increased volatility. And I think if you remember between Jan to March or April this year, we had extremely low volatility as measured by something like a WIX. So volatility being faster mean reverting and it's kind of short back up. We have to live with this volatility for the, for the next few weeks at least. Uh, I think the best thing for, for investors to do right now, and that's what we are advising everybody we talk to, is not to panic in this environment. Uh, the markets come off about 10 to 12 percent from its peak. It's not to say that you know we have things that are going wrong in the domestic environment or in the, on, the, on the fundamental side. So I think this is a godsend opportunity for people who would like to build portfolios to use this volatility and, and correction you know, that we are seeing right now to build portfolios with a, with a two to three year horizon. And I think if you continue to focus on companies and, and sectors that have a very strong linkage to our domestic demand, consumption and growth story, there is very high likelihood that you will, you will not go wrong and you will actually make decent returns from, from these levels. Hmm. So Nathan, at Motila Roswal, now what exactly, which spaces do you still think have a lot of value to be unlocked and probably clients, if they invest right now, they can actually reap the benefits going forward, maybe even uh, in the shorter term period, probably for uh, 10 to 15 percent and upside. So I think uh, again, you know, if you build on the theme that we just talked about, which is to focus on the domestic consumption story, clearly there are there are players that are in there. For example, automobiles, uh, you know, for example, consumer goods, even banks. I mean, banks is actually one of our top picks right now. And I think things to avoid will really be things that have high degree of correlation with the global markets. For example, commodities, especially metals. Uh, you know, it's very hard to predict what happens in in Europe, what happens in China, and hence. Uh, you know, it's very, very hard to take a call on what's going to happen to commodity prices. So, realizations may fall or rise depending on global prices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, those are some things that you would, you know, we, we are recommending investors to try to avoid right now. But I think if you focus on things like autos, you know, banks, consumer goods, um, you know, capital goods, all of these are, are great opportunities right now. Right. Uh, good morning, uh, Nathan. Um, my question would relate uh, more first to how you view uh, liquidity flows. Uh, or the availability of capital. Um, A, do you think uh, whether it is the European crisis or whether China's uh, uncertainty, if it is going to impact flows into stocks, which is you know secondary market flows, and whether you think it will be difficult for companies in the infrastructure space or the real estate space, I mean basically cash guzzlers, uh, to raise easy money as we saw perhaps in the middle of 2009. If you could answer that question from, you know, just the availability of capital for cash guzzling uh, sectors like infrastructure and uh, real estate and then for secondary flows uh, into secondary markets. Sure. I think from a domestic liquidity perspective, there is ample liquidity in the system and I think even the, the actions from the Reserve Bank last night uh, have, have, you know, aimed at strengthening that liquidity over the next, you know, 30 to 45 days. So we don't see any short-term concerns on liquidity, even though the demands are, are fairly high from a, from a credit growth perspective. In fact, that's precisely the reason why we are very focused on banking as a sector, because we believe that the credit growth will actually pick up a lot more than what we've seen in the last two quarters. So I think there, there is ample liquidity in the system. Uh, you know, there is uh, all the levers of liquidity are with, with the Reserve Bank. Uh, on the so you know whether infrastructure companies, telecom companies, real estate companies, I think they should have ample you know, access to liquidity and obviously the price of, of liquidity will be dependent upon you know, each individual company's uh, you know, uh, project projections and, and their credit worthiness. Uh, from the point of view of the flows into the secondary market, I think the biggest variable in those flows really is the FII flows and we've seen what they can do you know, in, in the first three or four months of, of this year we got six billion dollars of inflows and in the last you know, three weeks we've seen almost you know, a billion dollars out of that going out. So I think there is obviously a, a strong correlation between global environment and FII flows. And it's not so much that people take a negative view on India, but a lot of this money is tied into emerging market funds or emerging market CTFs. 
and hence when you see a redemption in those or when you see compression in values of other peers like China, rebalancing actually forces FIIs to, to sell out India and make sure that the portfolio weightages stay in line because most of these portfolios are indexed to, you know, to leading market indices. So I think global flows will, con and that's one of the reasons, biggest reasons why we see volatility uh, you know, correlation between India and, and the global market. So I think in the short term, we will have to we have to live with the volatility of flows and hence the volatility of prices. But I think in the longer term, uh, you know, that, that should actually smoothen out and we will still be one of the most preferred destinations for global investors to put money in. Right. Nitin, uh, just a two-part question here, you know, firstly on the Indian financial system and the stability going forward considering, you know, there's a lot of uh, talks about how interest rates are going to fluctuate going forward as well and also currencies, that has also seen a little bit of a movement on the upside with the dollar index of the 52-week high. The impact of that obviously on the technology space. So two-part question with the financial starting off. So I think uh, uh, they're kind of related, you know, both are related questions any which ways, but effectively looking at where we are from a financial stability perspective, I think we've had a fairly, uh, you know, well-defined movement from managing the crisis to business as usual over the last six months and hence we've seen some efforts from the RBI to control inflation by, by using liquidity and, and then interest rate as a tool. So given the fact that some of the global flows are slowing down, I think the impact of a liquidity glut causing inflation obviously is, is, is eased right now. So I think from a stability perspective we have no concerns. The NPA position of banks is fairly manageable, actually very good. Uh, credit demand is picking up in the system, interest margins are fairly stable and, and growing. I mean, if, you know, if banks like you know, SBI and HDFC are, are talking about a 20 to 30 percent growth uh, you know, at, at a top line and a bottom line level, then obviously you know, there is fairly high degree of opportunity in, 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 in that sector per se. Right. Uh, you know, going, going forward to the other part of the question about what happens to currency and the global macro you know, outlook, again it's a, it's a very close linkage to dollar flows. We've seen a billion dollars being pulled out in four weeks and obviously the currency is, you know, is showing that. It's also to do with the global strength of dollar versus the, the other basket of currencies, specifically the weakness in Euro. Uh, again, I think most uh, you know, Indian corporates have learned their lessons from 2008 and are managing the currency much better and that includes the IT sector. In fact, if you see you know, companies like Infosys have given projections at 44 half. So if, if rupee happens to be at 46 or 47, and if it stays in that range, then obviously there is an upside to the earnings that, that, that will come in. So I think, uh, you know, broadly, uh, we, we expect that the volatility in currency to be in line with the volatility in the global, you know, dollar, dollar versus other okay. baskets. From a manageability of those flows, from a manageability by Indian corporates, it, it should really be, be a function of. Hey, Nathan, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for joining us today.